Hello, BG First. Welcome to week five of our Discipleship 201 course study of the book, The Good and Beautiful God by Dr. James Bryan Smith. Chapter five is entitled, God is Love. And as I was reading through this chapter, I began to realize that there are two levels of potential challenge with this chapter. The first level is for those who are hearing for the first time this, this message that God is more focused on us than he is our sin. This idea for a lot of longtime Christians can be both exciting and frightening at the same time. You see, the excitement comes from understanding that, that amazing and incredible love that God has for us. The fear comes from the sudden realization that in some new way, they're now totally free. That's the real paradigm shift for us, though, isn't it? As we move from legalism over to love, it's a frightening transition because our true motives, as ugly as they can be, begin to be realized and revealed. You see, it's frightening for us to begin to realize that we have been obeying God out of a fear of hell, a get out of hell free card, rather than out of a desire to simply be with God. The second challenge comes for, or from those of us who have grown numb or apathetic to this message. Normally the real problem for those of us in this camp is not necessarily that we've heard the message too many times. The, the problem really is that we haven't experienced the message at deeper and deeper levels. You see, the concept or narrative of conditional love from God resides very, very deep within us. Many of us have heard this type of message for a lot of years growing up in legalistic churches, and it's, it's going to require a lifetime of encounters with the gracious God we actually serve in order to be truly healed from that type of toxic belief about God. Now, before we continue, I want to pause for a second and have you ask each other a question, okay? Growing up, for you, were you taught to see God as a God who has conditional who is conditional with his love? Let me ask that again. Growing up, were you taught to see God as a God who is conditional with his love? Or were you taught to see God more as a gracious God that loved you without conditions or behavioral requirements? When you're done discussing that question, those couple questions, come on back. Well, welcome back. You know, I think that most of us probably believe and have personally observed that love is conditional, that it's based on our behavior, right? We all probably have a personal story of two of how that was proven to you. Probably not a very nice way either, right? Therefore, most people transport their human experiences with love over to God. And we believe that God also loves us only when we're good, right? But here's the thing. Jesus told of a God who loves without condition. He told of a God who even loves sinners. How about that? And that thought truly does blow our minds. Don't believe me? Let me put it like this. The world we live in teaches us that love and acceptance are determined by our behavior, right? If we're good, we get good grades, win the game. Then we receive affirmation and attaboys and pats on the back, right? But if we fail, we experience disappointment and rejection and often punishment, right? And because we've been trained up in this type of earthly system, we project this conditional kind of acceptance onto God. Assuming that God only loves us when we're good and completely rejects us when we're bad. Before we go much further, I, I want you to pause the video and I want you to read Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 through 13 together. Read it out loud, read it together. Then go ahead and ask each other these few questions. If you need to rewind it back to keep up with the, the questions or remember the questions, feel free to do that. Number one, what Jesus was teaching, was it controversial for his time? Was it controversial? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Number two, why do you think it was important to Jesus that he go and eat with Matthew? that he actually go to his house and, and, and eat with him. Why? What was the point of doing that? What was the message he was sending and who was he sending it to? 
Okay, those are the questions. Go ahead and discuss and then come on back. Well, once again, welcome back. Hope you had some really good discussion with those questions. You know, Jesus' behavior was shocking in his day. I'm sure you probably came up with that conclusion on your own. The very idea of welcoming and spending time with and dining with people who were known as sinners, it just wasn't done, especially for a rabbi. You know, I think Jesus knew that he could talk about his father's love until he was blue in the face. I think he knew that. But he all, and he knew that it would only go so far. He knew that he had to show them. He couldn't just talk about it any longer. He had to actually show them. Jesus' behavior in this situation with Matthew, it revealed his core beliefs about God's love for people. No conditions. Unconditional. Jesus went on to tell story after story of a God who loves even those who reject him. Even people who know very little about the Bible have probably heard the most famous story Jesus ever told, right? The parable about a father who just pours out his unconditional love on his wayward son. He lavishes on him for no good reason, unconditionally. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself why? Why did Jesus tell that story? What was the point? Well, I believe that Jesus' primary intention in telling the parable of the prodigal son is not so much to teach about God's acceptance of sinners, but to indict those who reject the idea of unconditional love and acceptance. Hmm. On page 103 in in the book, The Good and Beautiful God, there's this poem written by George Herbert way back in the 17th century. Now, this poem describes a person's hesitation to accept God's grace because he or she fears God's rejection due to sin and to failure. I think it's a place where we all are even in 2020, right? In the poem, Herbert offers a beautiful picture of the God that Jesus knew. So I want you to go ahead and pause the video, and I want you to read through the poem together. It's not very long. It's about half of a page. And then pick out one thing, just one thing, that really spoke to you. And then I want you to share why it caught your attention, okay? So go ahead and read through that poem together. Pick out that one thing that really spoke to you, and then talk about why it was that it caught your attention. When you're done with that, come on back for one last exercise, all right? All right, I hope you enjoyed that poem. Hope you had some good discussion. Our soul training for this week is found on page 108 through 111 and is entitled Lectio Divina. Have you ever heard of the Lectio Divina? Kind of a crazy name, I'm sure. It just kind of sounds kind of strange to us, but the Lectio Divina. I was first exposed to it by the last senior pastor I served under at Shepherd Nazarene, Dr. Sam Barber. You know, At the time that I was exposed to the Lectio Divina, I was struggling to find much life in my Bible study. It was a bit dry, I guess I would say. Have you ever experienced times like that? Well, it was about that time that I was introduced to the Lectio Divina, and it's simply a method for studying Scripture. And for me, at that time, at that point in time, it was life-giving. It was like water in a desert for me. It really spoke to my heart. It spoke to my soul. So do me a favor. Don't prejudge. Follow the directions listed in the pages and try it out. It's just another tool to put in your tool bag of getting to know this mysterious God that we all serve. And then after you've tried it out, drop me a line and let me know how it went for you, okay? I really do want to know. Well, that's it for week five. And we'll see you next week for chapter 6, which I'm really excited about, God is Holy. This is a significant chapter in this book, and I hope you don't miss it. God bless you. Know that I love you, and I'm thinking about you, and I'm praying for you, and we'll see you next week.